what was your first cricketing memory? <sighs> Tough one. Believe it or not, my first cricketing memory was not visual. Okay. It was actually uh, audio. And the reason I say that, obviously one watched cricket uh, being played maybe in the, in the Maidans or on the side of the road and all of that. But anything remotely serious, uh, I think my first and most abiding memory would have been as a really, really young boy, and I don't even remember the full details, uh, was on the radio listening or watching my dad with his uh, ear to the, to the transistor set glued to listening to some test match commentary very early in the morning. So I'm assuming it would have been probably the West Indies. I can't think of any other place where it would have been that early. And we used to have this uh, old sort of uh, wireless uh, thing, you know, where you hung out the, strung out the aerial outside in a mesh and a, mm -hmm. and a gramophone connected. So you had sort of stations marked on it. So you had Alexandria, I remember, was the first because it was alphabetical. And then it went all the way across to whatever uh, alphabet it was and crackling sounds. And that really is, uh, and the fork of the, the bat on ball, I think those are sounds which are embedded in, in, in my head from a very young age. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if I was to then start thinking about sort of seriously watching a game of cricket, um, probably mid 70s, uh, when I must have been nine years or thereabouts, mm -hmm. nine or 10 years old. Uh, going with some friends to watch one day of a four-day match in uh, in Pune uh, at the old stadium, not the new one, where I remember we'd all rushed there because we'd heard that it was a West Zone game, which meant that Sunil Gavaskar, um, as a young lad, uh, you know, Ajit Vadekar, all of these big names were going to be playing and those were the days before all this franchise cricket and uh, that was I think the first real game I, I watched or, or serious game of cricket I watched. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not mistaken was one of your parents in the army and if so can you describe yes. a little bit about what your family life was like? Oh, absolutely with with great joy my my dad in fact we are a um, family of army men um, and may well be become uh, army women one of these days, but I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, yes, so my grandfather on my maternal side uh, served uh, in what was then, of course, the British Army. He was a doctor, and he served amongst many other places in North Africa during the war. And there are some wonderful memories that got passed down to me from my mother. But with my immediate family, my father uh, actually joined the army in a very interesting twist. He and his elder brother, they were a family of seven boys and two girls. And he and his elder brother decided that it was time that one of them would uh, join the freedom struggle and the other would necessarily need to take a job in the army so that there would be some money that could come back. Mm -hmm. Because my paternal grandfather was a headmaster. He was a headmaster of a school in a small town in Maharashtra. Mm -hmm. And my dad lost the toss and ended up uh, going to what was then called Nasik Road, which is a town not very far from here, which was the major recruitment center for the what was then called the Queen's Commission, which meant that you were joining as an all ranks person, like a sepoy, mm -hmm. not in the officer grade. And my dad joined the army then. He went on uh, post-independence to actually go to staff college, which also got him into the officer cadre. Not too many people uh, were able to make that transition. I remember his uh, Indian commission number, as it was called, was 771. So there couldn't have been too many officers before him. Um, and he went on to then uh, do rather well in the army. He retired as a brigadier commanding uh, one of India's elite artillery regiments. Uh, he, of course, was a gunner as, as an artillery man, fought in the 62, 65, and 71 wars. 
And um, the only thing he had uh, from a battle injury perspective was to have lost the nerve that connected his little finger when in the 62 war, apparently a grenade was lobbed across and he was alert enough, I suspect, to pick it up. I don't think he caught it, but tossed it back. And as he was tossing it back, it exploded. So some shrapnel probably stayed, um, which resulted in that nerve getting cut. Uh, later on, of course, my elder brother, both his sons have all carried on in the same uh, regiment, which is two field regiment. Um, one of the very heroic and well rewarded and acknowledged regiments in the Second World War as well. Uh, in the in North Africa, in Bir Hakim is one of the battle honors they have where they held up a panzer division for a long time. Wow. But uh, my memories growing up with him was... Uh, traveling and changing towns and schools every two years, sometimes less than that. So by the time he retired and came to Pune, I'd already been in about, I think, six schools by the time I got to grade seven. And um, it, was a, it was a lovely experience. I have some old black and white pictures of those, which uh, now as I get older, I start looking at and, and uh, wondering what, what I can do with them. Uh, but yes, it was it was a memory filled with discipline, uh, mm -hmm. very hard discipline, but a lot of love and care. And therefore, the army is really my uh, my second family. I, I still feel that way. I've been lucky to go and attend reunions of the regiment with my nephews. Mm -hmm. uh, and I take great pride. I'm the I keep saying that maybe I was the the best army officer the Indian Army never had. And the reason for it was very simple, Oliver. Many moons ago, I once said to my dad uh, that I'd like to join the army, but I want to start as a general. And he said, well, unfortunately, that's not how it works. And I think that was the end of that. I remember getting uniforms tailored for myself with, you know, American sergeant stripes on them because the commando comics were one of my favorite reads. But I'll stop. I mean, I can go on talking about this. No, that's all right. And the thing that interests me about what you said was that it's a... You said it was a, I'm not sure if you used the word privilege exactly, but you said it was a great thing to be able to visit all these different schools and be sort of integrated into army lifestyle without being part of the army yourself. I imagine that was really quite disruptive though, because from people I know personally who have had that kind of army military upbringing, it's great because you get to go see all these different places, but in terms of establishing a home and somewhere to have a bit of continuity in your life with your your schooling for example that can be quite disruptive can't it yes i, I suspect uh, it can be um the reason i never thought of it like that because i guess i got used to it so early in life that i've just carried on i mean in 37 years of being married uh we are in our 15th home so i guess that uh, army wow. travel bug uh continued with me in my in my professional career as well and look, new places have never phased me. Uh, what I do miss when I compare myself to other friends that I've now had over years in Pune particularly, is they have friends that they went to primary school with. And they're all in their 60s now, but they still have memories from there. Unfortunately, I don't have too many of those uh, at all because all these uh, friendships were relatively short. Uh, mm -hmm. But fortunately, like I said, I got back to Pune with dad retired, retiring um, in the mid 70s. And so I did get a full 10 year uh, stint in Pune with my school, my early college and then my post graduation all happening here. So I do have that in some ways I have a best of both worlds. So, no, mm -hmm. I never felt it disruptive. I know a lot of people today feel that way, including our daughter. Okay. Uh, she feels it was very disruptive for her. Uh, but maybe it was just generational uh, or maybe attitudinal. I yes. see it as a great way to adapt to to many different situations. Yeah, no, life lessons for, for everybody. If you have that, I say, if you don't necessarily have that fixed home to come to, you find a way to get a home for yourself in the situation you're presented with. And I think that's something that you only get when you've had that experience of living abroad, all of which we'll come on to talk to um, in a little bit. But... First, I have to ask, Prakash, you've agreed to partake in my, what I would call cruel thought experiment, where you only have one last chance to watch cricket. How do you think you'll cope 
with only having one game left. I hope I'm not alive to watch it. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> because if I'm ever told that this is the last game of cricket that's going to be played, mm -hmm. um, I am certain that I won't live to watch it. Something will happen to me. But if it is a slightly different twist on that question, which is that this is the last game you are going to watch, uh, that is, I'm going to watch. And someone asked me, what would you like to watch or what game would you like to watch? Mm -hmm. I think I would love to be able to pick um, sort of a, a world 11 against mm -hmm. the might of Clive Lloyd's West Indians or maybe even earlier because I don't know the earlier ones or I haven't seen them and have it have a like a five test series um, probably not in England because it's just too much disruption by rain mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe maybe in Australia uh, maybe in in the West Indies um, and watch you know all these great mm -hmm. players come together and and see them perform over a period of five tests because you don't want to watch a one-off test um, and, and that would really be how I would handle it. But yes, I hope that day never comes, or at least I'm not aware. Okay. Well, in that case, we'll, um, I, I, I will, I'm pleased to say that I can give you access to the dream cricket field. So you can, even if it's going to be a terrible day, you can prepare for that eventuality and hopefully it won't be quite as much of a shock to your system when it does happen. So if you had access to a dream cricket field, and you could make this match take place. I know you said about the World Eleven, but you could make this final match of yours just for you, for your sake, take place anywhere in the world. Which is your favourite cricket ground? Which ground will this match be taking place at? Really hard one for anyone who enjoys cricket. I think... I think I'm going to say the old Eden Gardens in Kolkata. And I say old with an emphasis on it before it all this remodeling stuff happened. Because with the, the, the aura of the Eden Gardens with over 100,000 people in it, in flat stands with nothing but wooden uh, or stone slabs uh, to put your backsides on, um, except for a very small number of privileged few, um, hardly any air conditioning, uh, commentary boxes in the open, and just the sound, the the smells, the uh, the aura of old Kolkata, uh, mm -hmm. with with its massive maidans or grounds and fields around it, um, is, is something to behold. And I would love for the game to be played there uh, because in back in the day. Uh, and I hope that if I have a chance, I can curate a wicket, which is the classic test match wicket, which sort of has a bit in it for everybody on the first two days, third day onwards, maybe a little bit more for the spinners. And then on the last day, uh, it's a real test of batting if you have good spinners in the side. Mm -hmm. I think that's that would be my dream sort of construct. Mm -hmm. Okay, I should have known when I invited you on, Prakash, that you would come back with, you want to curate the pitch as well as choose your favourite one, sort of the the cricket brain going at a million miles an hour still um, should have been aware, should have known. But anyway, thank you for that. Um, now, I want to ask you a little bit about your time at school. Mm -hmm. It strikes me that you might be, and I know you probably want to say this about yourself, a bit of an overachiever, given all of the successes you've had in all the different sort of fields of your life that you've you've been striving for success in. What were you like as a student? Would your teachers describe you as a, a teacher's pet, per chance? Mm, unlikely. Um, I <laughs> probably have the dubious distinction in latter part of school and early part of college. You know, in India, we used to have this, uh, this system. I suspect it must be a pass down from the British schooling system of a merit list and a blacklist. Mm. Uh, on the blacklist because you've had uh, things uh, which you've done which are not positive, not good, um, and therefore you get sort of blacklisted. I've been on both in my last year of, last two years of school and the first couple of years of college. So I was, I guess, a prankster. I was someone who maybe didn't attend all of my classes. 
but maybe a quirk of fate uh, that I was pretty decent with my academics. I had a, a government scholarship for the bulk of my schooling. Um, I topped the university in my accounting course when I did my graduation, mm -hmm. as well as the uh, the gold medal at my MBA program. I suspect that has a lot more to do with all my other classmates rather than me. Okay. I think they, they must have had a lot more interest in other things than than I was necessarily uh, that far good. But mm -hmm. yes, I mean it it meant a lot at the time. As you look back on life, Oliver, you you realize. Yeah, these are all passing things. They don't really matter much. But I think I made my parents proud and that does matter. Mm -hmm. And you use that word prankster. Can you give mm. me an example of what a prankster <laughs> prakash would look like? Oh, tons of them. My most favorite one is is actually a horrible one. Okay. Uh, but I will I will tell you anyway. And then you can decide whether it passes muster from an editorial perspective. Well, no. Um, you can cut it out by all means. And if you think that way, tell me and I'll tell you another one. Uh, this was in college, in our second year of college. We had a principal who was, I guess as students feel, sometimes teachers and principals can be really terrible people and well, while they're actually not. Um, and he used to live on campus uh, and we were day boarders. There were students who used to live in the hostel, but because it was Pune, we were day boarders. And somehow we had this absolutely crazy, wacky idea. His clothes would be hanging um, on, a, on a line outside in the backyard. And for what earthly reason, I don't know, but one particular day, five, six of us, we decided that we had to do something. And so we went out stealthily and got an undergarment off the, uh, off the clothes line and went and managed to actually put it on the flag post, which was right on top of the main building of the college. <laughs> and when, when people came to, to college the next day, they actually saw this uh, undergarment <laughs> fluttering. Uh, gods were kind, there was a wind. And that got all, all of us into some really serious trouble. But that's probably the craziest that I can think of. Uh, so in some ways, harmless, but uh, very punishable. I don't know. I kind of expected better from you, Prakash. I mean, we haven't met before, but you come across as a very, very well put together, very mature person. And then you hear these stories of you back in the day. You think that can't be the same Prakash. Come on, honestly. Life, life changes. We're all like a bit, bit like a good, uh, good test pitch, right? We, we change as, as time goes by. And I think, um, you know, you, you'll not believe me looking at me. I used to have long hair. Um, I used to sort of ensure that they uh, flopped in the air when I ran into bowl, even though I was not much of a bowler. Uh, Imran Khan's images were always fresh in my mind. So, yeah, things change. Things change a lot. Mm, sure. And at this point, when you were at school, um, was it just cricket, cricket, cricket? Or did you take such pleasure in your academic subjects that you'd already started to think, okay, well, I really love cricket, but also there's there's more to, to this than just trying to make it as a cricketer? Oh, clearly. Uh, I mean, look, the, the, the writing was on the wall. Uh, we, we knew that we had to, uh, you know, do well academically to get a job. It was very clear that um, one had to start working and earn, uh, earn, a, earn a living. Um, and so academics were important. And as I said earlier, I was able to manage both my academics and my cricket rather well through school and college. And I think that was good training to, to be able to then manage my commentary and my work life later. I think that that helped very clearly in, in terms of how we were able to, to proceed. Mm -hmm. And sorry for a very self-indulgent question. People who listen regularly will hear this coming quite a lot through most of the episodes. But I really should have started this interview by saying, and sorry for pronunciation, is it nam Namaskar? Is that Marathi for hello? Yes, hello. Namaskar. Namaskar, okay, close enough. You say Namas and then just add the four-wheeler at the end. Oh, and then... Namaskar. Um, and I say that because you speak four languages, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, do, you, yeah. do you, is that right? Just check this quick. Is that four languages more? Yeah, I speak, I speak uh, possible 
uh, probably a few more, but yeah, with some degree of comfort for. Mm -hmm. And I guess, did you notice a particular affinity for languages when you were growing up? And how much importance have you placed on communicating fluently in all those different languages? And do you think that's indicative of the success you've had in all of the various areas of your career so far? I think that's a brilliant question. And it goes back to the army again. Because as you would imagine in the Indian army, like most armies around the world, you will have people from all over. And I used to watch my dad, even if it was 10 words, five words, maybe just a greeting, but being able to use uh, different languages to greet different people uh, was something that I observed very early on. And as my work career moved along, uh, having worked in, in very many different parts of the world, uh, I realized and wanted to carry that on. So I was able to, um, I think my Sanskrit uh, learning at school helps in diction. Mm -hmm. So whether it was Khmer in Cambodia or a little bit of Thai or even a bit of Potungwa in China, I was, I was able to get by. I was by no stretch fluent, mm -hmm. but uh, I was able to learn enough to be able to, uh, to speak. And I think to your second part of the question, how important it is, I think it is hugely important because if nothing else, you are telling a person into whose home, domain, society or country you've gone into that you care, that you acknowledge uh, that they are different linguistically, at least, if not any other way. Mm -hmm. And you are willing to make that effort um, and you also tend to disarm people. You, you tend to get them uh, to, to drop their guard, not in a bad way, but in a nice way, to be able to open up, to talk about culture, talk about food, family. I think it makes a huge difference. I mean, if I had the opportunity to write education policy, mm -hmm. I would almost mandate that every child should, I mean, as much as you can force anybody, uh, to learn anywhere between three to four languages well and po probably get a working knowledge of a few more because it's it's the window to the world mm -hmm. uh, if you can do that. Yeah, no, I think perspective is something I come back to a lot. But, but the people I'm fortunate enough to interview and now yourself included on that list, those who I guess I hold in the highest esteem, I hold everyone in high esteem who, who I interview, obviously. But there's a notable trend of people who have extraordinary success that most people can't dream of in whatever profession they choose, whatever discipline they choose. And that sort of outward looking perspective that comes from either having spent a significant amount of time abroad, away from home, where you have to integrate with a local community or equally language learning and all these sort of soft skills that aren't necessarily your maths or your physics or whatever it is. But actually when it comes to sort of human interaction, makes such a fundamental difference to your your successes. And I don't think it's any coincidence on that point that you've also had such a successful commentary career as well, given your your efficiency for, for communication. But we'll move on very quickly. Um, now, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, practice time for your second choice. We are um, at the old Eden Gardens. Mm -hmm. And if you only had one last chance and you could choose any batter to be batting in the middle at Eden Gardens, who would you choose and why? These are real tough ones, right? All, all of these. There's, a, there's a, a conflict between my head and heart. My head says I want to see someone that I've never really watched bat. And that then becomes really a toss, a very close toss up between Sir Don Bradman and Sir Garfield Sobers. Um, and I think I will go with Sir Bradman because there's such an aura about the man and I've never never had the opportunity of seeing him back. So I'd love to see him back. We shall give you Sir Don Bradman. I think, interesting, that's the first time anyone's chosen Don Bradman, which you'd think, given his, his stature within the cricket world, you'd think he might be more sector more often. Um, but anyway, thank you for that. Um, now, Prakash, we know you best as a quite brilliant commentator. But I wonder, and I know you're you're modest in all of these things, but what were you like as a player? 
I think I was reasonable. Uh, I was reasonably good. I uh, represented my state in the under-19, under-22 camps, uh, played for the state. Um, I was picked for uh, a national preparatory camp uh, for the Indian schoolboys, um, where I suspect my head wasn't really in the right place, and I skipped it because it clashed with what we call our 12 standard exams, which is like the O-levels. Um, and if I look through some of the people who were in that camp, um, a few names, uh, Sanjay Manzrekar, um, Kiran Ravish, Morin, Ravi Shastri, uh, Ravi Shastri um, Navjot Sidhu, um, and a few others, uh, many of them did go on to play for India. I'm not suggesting I would have, but uh, certainly I was pretty good. I was an opening batsman. Uh, Sunil Gavaskar was and remains to this day my absolute idol. Um, I copied his batting as best as I could, not with great success, as you can imagine, but uh, right up to the point of, you know, having the left toe slightly up in the air as you took your stance uh, or the floppy hat, um, the way to sort of wipe the uh, wipe the sweat off your brow, all of those things to the point where uh, I was very chuffed when a lot of my friends and colleagues and team used to start calling me Sonny which was uh, really nice. Uh, I didn't pay anyone for it, but I'd happily have paid them if I if I needed to. Uh, so yeah, I was pretty good. I, I went on to then uh, not obviously not play uh, serious professional cricket, but when I was in Singapore, I represented the Singapore Cricket Club as to open the batting for them. Um, and I think I had a pretty straight bat. Mm -hmm. and, and what is it about opening the batting specifically that took your fancy? Because that's quite a tough role to take on, isn't it? Best opportunity to bat the longest. Simple the batter's mindset, yeah. Simple as that. Just bat and bat and bat. I didn't succeed always, but you tried. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, you've mentioned the names who were at that camp, the Maharashtra under-22s. And um, we know what they went on to achieve, obviously. I wonder, looking back now, if you were speaking to your 21-year-old self back then with what you know now, would you advise him to do what you did and take the exam rather than attend the camp? Or yes, would you? So. You would have still. Okay. I think so. I think so. And, and I think the reason for that is very simple. I think it's just in my nature to be cautiously optimistic and positive. Um, for me, the priorities of that 21-year-old Prakash in that situation would still remain the same. Mm -hmm. And uh, with a with a retired father and a mother, not that I had to send them money for their keep, but at least to ensure that I was standing completely independent and, and wasn't a burden in any way on them, uh, I would have wanted a job. And those days, Oliver, in India, you could only get a job from a sporting perspective, mm -hmm. either with the airlines, the government-run airlines, or the state banks, or the railways. And if you didn't get that, there were very few corporates which had started, just started around the 80s, to start employing uh, cricketers purely or sports people, purely as sports people. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just wasn't sure that I was going to be good enough to be able to make that. I mean, you had to be Gavaskar or Kapil Dev or Shastri to be able to really make any money uh, worth uh, talking about uh, purely playing cricket back in those days. Yeah. So th there is no regret within you None that you try None. and play no. for India. Mm. None. Interesting. I think that's a lot. I think that says a lot about your 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 mindset and your attitude to being sort of quite pragmatic in that sense. Because I think for a lot of people, it'd be very easy to be blown over by the idea of making it as a as an international cricketer and looking at all the people and you're you're so close to making that that leap. But actually, it seems like you're able to remove yourself a little bit from that and think that would be that would be great on its own. But in the situation that I'm in what actually is best for me. And um, once again, I think that says a lot about how you've ended up where you are now, which I find fascinating. Straight, straight bat, mate, straight bat. <laughs> Always straight bat. Um, Most of the time. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, Prakash, this is such an engaging conversation that I've uh, forgotten. We have something of a format to stick to. So I'm going to ask you for your third choice. Mm -hmm. um, who will be bowling at Eden Gardens to Sir Donald Bradman? Sir Garfield Sobers. And I will leave it to him whether he wants to bowl 
quick left arm. He wants to bowl spin, round over, Chinaman, regular, whatever he wants. Because that would be a battle to behold in my mind. Uh, watching one of the greatest with the ball bowl to one of the greatest with the bat. Mm. And I say Garfield Sobers, I should qualify that. Because there are greater bowlers, no question. But again, A, someone I've never seen bowl uh, live. And B, because I think when you put two geniuses in front of each other, then the, the chess in the cricket comes out. Mm -hmm. uh, replacements, tactics, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you think modern day, you think of Sachin Tendulkar and, and the late Shane Warne, and you think about how each of them would have been scheming against the other, and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. Those famous matchups, I think, is the operative phrase today. Mm -hmm. Sure. Now, Prakash, you have a Bachelor's of Commerce and an MBA. I wonder, for somebody who had uh, cricketing aspirations of sorts, as we've discussed, what attracted you then to not just going into business, but also studying business to such a high level? Because it was uh, an MBA degree was a passport to a job, Oliver. Um, it was the probably one of the easiest ways, uh, in a manner of speaking, to be able to get a job in a, in a good company or a good corporation and build a career. I knew nothing else. Um, for me, you know, the options that my daughter or people her age have today were never there. Um, and so it was clear that you you had to get a job. And the best way to do it, in my opinion, at the time was to be able to get this degree. And it opened doors and uh, we had campus placement. We had campus interviews. Uh, job offers were made at campus. I chose to do, do it slightly differently. I did have a campus offer, but I chose to join a, a different corporation, not the one that offered me a job at campus. But that was a simple and straightforward reason. Get a job. Okay. So did you learn to enjoy learn to love business or would you say it was purely a practical step just to just to get a job to begin with i think it was very much a practical step you you wanted to earn a living as i said earlier but for me the uh, the fact that i was able to achieve whatever little i have would never have happened if i didn't enjoy it uh, there were there are things that i hated about it and i still hate and there are things that i absolutely love i mean the ability to make a difference to people's lives whether as colleagues, whether as people working in the organization that you can influence uh, lives off or the community, the consumers, the stakeholders, government, society. Uh, I think all of that uh, and the ability to do it or the opportunity to do it, I should say, mm -hmm. uh, were all things that I thoroughly enjoyed, uh, enjoying butting heads with competition. So in my years at Coca-Cola, uh, it was very clear, God, country, and Coca-Cola, anything else that remotely masqueraded as a carbonated beverage was complete crap uh, and, and simply shouldn't be drunk. I mean, I, I remember you know, saying things like, if you cut my veins, you're probably going to get Coke and blood. Uh, uh, it was just uh, the exuberance of youth, the maybe displaced, if you think back then. Uh, at the time, that was the way we were. So I certainly enjoyed lots of things. Did not enjoy uh, this whole quarterly result business. Still don't like the idea that some analyst sitting somewhere determines the fortunes of your, of your business in terms of valuation and pricing. Uh, still don't understand and can't get my head around, you know, how a company that is va gets valued at multiple, multiple times of the amount of money they lose not the profit they make, but that's the reality of the day. Yes, indeed. And just quickly, I wonder, how did you harmonize your business ambitions with your commentary ambitions? And at what point was there that competition starting to think, okay, I can maybe try and manage both at the same time here? I was very fortunate, Oliver. I have to confess that I think I had very supportive uh, supervisors, managers, bosses in my early years. And I was very clear that I would essentially use my annual leave to do commentary. So in that sense, commentary was always want to do it, love to do it, will do it when able. And when able meant availability of time from work. So you needed two things to fall in place. You needed uh, organizational support or supervisory support, managerial support, whatever. 
but you also needed uh, understanding on the side of the broadcaster. Because unlike today's era where you and I are doing this, 30 years ago, this simply didn't happen, right? You didn't have these kind of things. You needed a platform, you needed a BBC, you needed an All India Radio or whatever to be able to get an opportunity and go through the process. So I think A, I was lucky. B, I was very clear that this would be the second string to my bow, not the primary one. And as I got more opportunities and people uh, started sort of recognizing and acknowledging, uh, I tried to do a little bit more. So I stretched the envelope. Uh, as I got senior in the organization, I was able to say, listen, it doesn't matter whether I'm in Australia or England or, or wherever, I will carry through my responsibilities, uh, but also want to do commentary. So I would have very long days, many, many times when there was cricket commentary, because before or after the game, depending on time zones, I was still doing my work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, Prakash, it's time for your captain. Who would you see marshal the troops at Eden Gardens for your final time watching cricket? I would love to see Mansoor Ali Khan Patodi. Again, someone I never saw play, but whose, manage, whose captaincy, uh, acumen and leadership qualities uh, I have admired in everything I've read and heard from people. And I think Tiger Patodi would make a fantastic captain to have... Uh, uh, lead aside at the Eden Gardens. Okay. Can I just check for my own sake? Uh, how do you pronounce the name again? Tiger Patodi. Uh, Tiger was a nickname he picked up at Oxford. Okay. When he was still. But his full name was Mansoor Ali Khan Patodi. Okay. Patodi being the small principality that he would have become the, the Nawab of had the princely states continued in India. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Cool. It's great to have um, on the other side. It's great to have so many people from different perspectives coming in because you realize just how personal cricket is to people and how yes. it's everyone has their own individual relationship with it. And there's no one size fits all. There are so many great players that you could choose from, but actually it's it's what's with you rather than what's with just because they're the best doesn't necessarily mean that's what they'll choose, if that makes sense. Um, but that's great. Thank you for that. Now. I did mention, I'll keep being banging on about this, that you're a bit of an overachiever, as it strikes me. Could you talk about what you did at Harvard and Yale? Yes. Um, so both uh, Harvard and Yale were uh, corporate-sponsored uh, programs. Uh, they were part of a program that was called Future Leadership, uh, the Future of Leadership. Uh, and uh, I was fortunate this was part of, both of these were part of programs that went through over a year, but a specific uh, time at campus and a lot of off-campus work. Uh, so uh, when completed those programs uh, in uh, those two amazing universities, uh, seeing their professors, seeing the models, the case study methods, uh, the classrooms, I mean, everything was a, was an amazing experience, but as much for the alumni and the people you got to meet and talk to and the professors you you were able to pick their brains um, off were, were fascinating. So this was called, as I said, uh, the Future Leaders Program and uh, memory that, that I will always cherish. Very, mm. very. Mm. The reason I ask is because this is happening 30 years or so after you graduated from your MBA. I wonder what drives you to keep learning and keep developing and keep pushing the boat out in terms of, I guess, personal development, really? I don't think anybody in their right mind would want to stop that, whether formal or informal. Um, I mean, you know, what is it? 10 or 12 days ago, I met a, uh, a young man in Finland, actually, who uh, explained to me uh, the the art of sort of uh, skinning a particular kind of fish in uh, in the winter months, right? And how they do it. Now, I'm not even a, a fish eater, but for me, it was fascinating to understand the difference between someone who I've seen in in normal fish markets just chopping it up and then you know doing whatever they do and, and the skill that he required or the way he described it seemed like an art form. So 
filling your mind with things that you don't know, learning about them, respecting alternate views and thoughts, I think is, is, is normal or should be normal for all human beings in my mind. Degrees may vary and mm -hmm. ability may vary. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to give me a firm commitment right now, but do you reckon you've got another degree in you somewhere? Maybe a PhD in something cricket related as you retire potentially? I, I don't know. Uh, let me put it this way. I would not do it for the degree. Mm -hmm. If there was something very interesting and I could go back to, to school as it were, uh, I think I'd love to. Uh, so if, if there was an uh, exciting program to learn something new uh, and if it was cricket related, wow. I mean, look, if, if, the, if the ICC were to say to me, look, we could consider making you CEO Prakash, but you need to do this, this and this. I think I would say yes. Mm. I'll, I'll I'll start a campaign for you, Prakash Khan. We'll get you to be. Won't get you very far, mate. Been been up that road. Don't want to necessarily talk about it, but that's that's part of history now. Oh, well, there you go. Now, Prakash, um, that was getting far too political and 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 sensible for this kind of podcast. So it's time for your fifth choice. Who would you have fielding at Eden Gardens, and why? Uh, one player. One player, yeah. Eknath Solker fielding at forward short leg to the spin of Gary Sobers, bowling to Don Bradman with Pataudic skippering. Brilliant. <clears throat> Can't be better. Eknath Solker, in my mind, one of the, if not really the best close in fielders ever to grace a cricket field. No shin guards, no helmets. And you just have to ask anyone from the England or West Indies teams, particularly the English in 1971, mm -hmm. uh, what he meant uh, when, when he was fielding at forward shot leg or at silly point. There are instances where he's literally dived onto the pitch and caught the ball off the bat between bat and pitch. So just unbelievable. And you see some of that footage of that 1971 oval test match when India won the first series ever against England. And you will see Eknath Solkar. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable fielder. Yes. And that's reflected in the stats, of course. I was doing some research, like the good podcast host that I'm trying to be. And Eknath Solkar had 53 catches in only 27 matches, which is, according to ESPN Cricket Info, the best ratio for catches per test match among non-wicket keepers who played 20 or more tests. And so as there you said, go. And you said that was before a time where you had protective gear, um, all of that stuff. So it was just, it sounds like it's a courageous and hearty fielder with superior hand-eye coordination. Unbelievable, and, I'm sure. Unbelievable, he must have been. And see, I learned something now. I didn't know that stat. There you go. So there learning go. never stops. Learning never stops, indeed. Um, great, thank you for that, Prakash. Now, looking back on your dual careers, as I like to call it, one in business, one in cricket commentary, do you stop to reflect on which you have found more rewarding? I think the best way I can describe it is my work career put bread on the table and cricket in any form, including especially commentary, has been food for my soul. I think I would have gone mad if I didn't have cricket uh, and didn't have the opportunity to, to commentate and broadcast and talk. Um, so. I don't think I can pick one over the other because I don't think the other would have existed if it wasn't for the other. Mm. And I wonder, was there a time where you had enough opportunity in the commentary sphere, as you said, to go all in on nourishing your soul, where you could have potentially put, readjusted that priority to a certain extent, made the commentary the thing that put the bread on the table? And nourish us all. In, in, in more recent times, Oliver, that thought has crossed my mind because A, you started getting paid a little bit better. Um, but, and I won't name what organization, but I did speak to one organization that does a fair amount of sport and cricket. Um, but unfortunately, there wasn't any clear commitment that was likely to emerge. If it had, or if it does even now, Mm -hmm. um, I think I would grab it with both hands. But uh, this would have been in the last five years of my career.
career, not before that. There simply weren't that many opportunities. All India Radio, which was my primary uh, broadcast space before uh, BBC and TMS and so on, uh, never really paid enough money to be able to make a career. And once you work in the corporate world, you know, your lifestyle changes, your habits change. And then to be able to take care of all of that, you, you necessarily want a certain amount of money, which mm. may or may not have been available. So I guess I'll never know the answer. But at a conceptual level, did that cross my mind? Yes, in the last five, seven years, yes, it did. Mm, okay, interesting. It's good to hear that you're still open to suggestions. So in case somebody is listening who is looking for a, a full-time committed commentator, maybe they can get in touch. We'll see. Um, Prakash, thank you for that. It's time for your sixth choice. As I realize the time is slightly getting away from me because I'm so engaged in this conversation. Who will be wearing the gloves in the match? Again, head and heart conflict. I would want my dear, dear friend Kiran More to do it, but I will not uh, go with Kiran. I will go with one of my favorite wicket-keeping characters, Alan Knott. Okay. And I thought he was stunning. I mean, right from the the customized leg guards back in the day when all those materials weren't available. Um, the, the the character that he was the the kind of um, keeper that I know his record reflects, Alan Knott. Mm -hmm. Great. And now, Prakash, the next commentary, uh, excuse me, the next category is I'm going to make you choose is your your favorite commentator. And now you're not the first commentator we've had on, but I do have to ask you this: What do you remember of your first game where you were commentating, and more specifically? I'm interested in how nervous were you in that moment? Were, was there that excitement that you were going to do something you really enjoyed or were you really sort of trepidatious about what you're about to undertake? Okay, I'll, I'll answer that starting in reverse order. Absolutely no nerves, believe it or not. Uh, no, no concern, no tension, no pressure uh, because of the fact that I was doing this commentary at the Nehru Stadium in Pune, um, commentating on a game that Maharashtra were playing in the Ranji Trophy uh, with many of my very good friends and, co and, and former teammates playing in the game. I was broadcasting from an air-conditioned box uh, while they were sweating it out in the sun. And believe it or not, at the time, I was being paid about four and a half times what they were getting paid. Um, it's a different matter that what I was getting paid remained that way for decades. And, and thank God their payments went up. But the memory that stays with me is precisely this, that I was sitting here comfortably in this box. All these guys were out in the sun. And I was able to actually point out and say, maybe he could have done this or he could have done that, which in normal circumstance, I would never have. So the ability to be able to uh, look at the game from a, from a distance and be able to describe it to somebody. And there, uh, even though I might be exceeding my brief on the answer, there the lines, I think they were uh, <clears throat> from, uh, from uh, John Arlott, where he said that the job of a commentator will be to ensure that the listener can feel the breeze on his cheek when he has the transistor by his ear. And that is what uh, a broadcaster needs to do. That's always been my mantra. And and I think that ability to do it, howsoever good or limited, is what I've striven for. Mm. And I wonder, do you take the same joy in commentating now as you did back then? Absolutely. I am like a kid in a, in a chocolate factory. Uh, every time I get an opportunity to be in the commentary box, I think those that people that have been my producers will probably tell you that often they have to tap me on the shoulder to get me out of the chair. Uh, I'd love to carry on and do more. Um, yes, I absolutely love it. I absolutely love it. Mm. And this will lead on to you deciding who you want commentating over this final match. But I wonder, and the last thing I want to do is to burn bridges between you and your commentary colleagues and your commentary pals. But who are the commentators you most enjoy listening to? And 
not just listening to but also working with because there's a there's a distinction between those two things yes. and yes. what makes those individuals that cut above the rest okay clarificatory question commentators as in ball by ball descriptors of the game or what is now a more modern phenomena where you have uh, cricketing experts with you because that's it's two very different things I uh, assume it's the former <clears throat> correct right. so again for me from who I've enjoyed the most because here even if they're not there you've heard tapes you've had uh, opportunities. I think um, Christopher Martin Jenkins, uh, Tony Kozia, um, our own Dicky Ratnagar, who was probably the one Indian who went out and did some great work in, in England as well. Um, Dicky Ratnagar for sure. Um, television commentary for me is not part of this because television is very different. So I'm sticking to radio. Mm -hmm. uh, those three are right up there. I think in, in current uh, commentary commentators. Uh, Jim Maxwell is someone I admire a lot. Uh, Jonathan Agnew is superb, I think, in as much because of his tonality of voice as much for anything else. I mean, you could listen to, to Agar's uh, just talking about almost anything. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he's a great guy. Um, and, and I think I've heard Ian Bishop do some radio some years ago, and I think he was brilliant too, and that reflects in his television place. I don't know if David Garr ever did radio, but I think if he did, he would be marvellous. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if you had to choose, if I forced you to choose one to be commentating over this match at Eden Gar the old Eden Gardens. Who CMJ. CMJ. Okay. Okay. Good choice. Now, Prakash, we're nearing the end of the discussion, but I have to ask you this before we, we com come to an end. You've seen quite an extraordinary transformation I should probably call it revolution, really, rather than transformation in Indian cricket over your lifetime. And there are positives to this accessibility to cricket in India, cricket being a viable career path, like you said, about how much you're earning in the commentary box compared to the players on the pitch. But there are also negatives, as I see it. So the, the gatekeepers of Indian cricket in the BCCI now hold so much influence politically, financially, however you see it. So on balance... Do you see the revolution that's happened in Indian cricket over your lifetime being a positive change for India? Or are the negatives that come with having such a big powerhouse in charge of the game, sort of, do they temper that a little bit? Yeah, <clears throat> I think this is a, uh, frankly, it's a topic for a much longer discussion, but let me try and summarize this as best as I can. I think you've got to look at it from two perspectives. In the global order of cricket over my lifetime, there's always been a 20,000 pound gorilla. There was a time when maybe it was the folks who sat at Lords in the MCC. Uh, they may have quickly aligned in the early years with Australia. And it became sort of a, not ratio, but uh, a white uh, dominated, uh, West white dominated um, key force in cricket. Um, I think the tide slowly began to change as the center of... Um, I, I think it's correlated with the kind of money that came into cricket because up until the time the really big bucks started coming in, I mean, there's that famous story that the Indian Cricket Board did not have enough money to pay a promised reward to the 1983 World Cup winning team when it was announced by the president of the board without realizing that he didn't have the money. So there is that reality, and that's fairly recent. It's 83. So for all those years, there was a very different center of power that existed. Um, that started shifting, and I think today it's, it's only fair that we acknowledge the fact that, yes, India and the BCCI in that sense is very much the powerhouse. It is the powerhouse which is being driven by the amount of money that they are able to put back into the game. Uh, and the ability to therefore control the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. I don't think any form of uh, monopoly can be good for any activity. Leave aside cricket. You know, by and large, dictatorships aren't great for countries. There have been benevolent ones, but by and large, um, you can't really see companies thriving or corporations thriving if you have a singular my way or the highway approach. 
And therefore, I think uh, as a general rule, no single authority is very good. But we live in, in different times. And you have to then ask yourself if players, um, like you saw in football some years ago, uh, if players are, are willing to swap the national logo on their shirt with that of a franchise or a club, and that becomes priority, then what is being communicated is that the currency in which everything is being weighed is money. And if that is the currency, then it is up to the collective uh, of the cricket managerial boards and authorities to put sufficient money behind whatever they consider to be the priority. And that's the big debate about test match cricket. And there, I don't think you can fault the BCCI. The BCCI is doing, I think, more than its share to drive test match cricket. What catches the eye is the glitz, glamour and money around the IPL. And I dare say in many instances, not all, but many instances, for many, many people, it's just a case of sour grapes. Um, it is just that what is, is there. Are there people in the administration in Indian cricket who have a sensible mind and who will listen to alternate views and work with people? Yes, they will. Uh, I think it's also a much maligned institution because if you look at it from Indian cricket, the kind of money, resources, managerial coaching infrastructure that the Indian board has been able to put down into India is phenomenal. Uh, the kind of support they have provided to other boards from time to time, Sri Lanka, South Africa, West Indies, in terms of supporting them when required, uh, I think is also commendable. So I think... Often these things depend on perspective. I don't think any cricketing board in its right mind can put its heart on its okay, hand on its heart and say, we've never been guilty of driving a personal agenda. I think everybody has at some point in time or the other. Yes, in the current uh, environment, it is the Indian cricket board. Mm -hmm. And one can only hope that as time goes along, more and more uh, collaborative work will come through from there. And I do see those signs. I, I don't, I mean, I'm not worried about the fact that Indian franchises are owning, um, owners are owning franchises in other leagues. For, for Christ's sake, I mean, Jaguar Land Rover is now an Indian company. So if we are not stopping trans-global investments, right, if, um, you know, Glaxo Smith Klein for all the years that I knew was a British company and it did a huge amount of business in India, then why should anybody grudge anyone else? Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you for offering that perspective on India and BCI because it's something that for all the best will in the world, you can't necessarily get as clearly uh, from the UK. So I'm sure that will be of, of great interest to everybody here. Now, um, without saying that uh, politics is unimportant, it's time to talk about something that I would say is the most important that I ask every guest, and that's food. We're gonna talk about food. It's time for your final choice, and that's the cricket teas. In this dream scenario, what will you be having to eat at the lunch? Well, I have to put a caveat in. I have to not have the dietary challenges that I have today, because otherwise, it's a it's an absolute mess. I can have nothing but tea then in most okay. cases. Oh, God. but no, that's because I have a a, a gluten and a dairy allergy, which takes oh. away all the fun stuff. Mm -hmm. But so let's assume that I don't have that. Of and course. then then it's it's tea at Lord's for me. It's tea with with scones and and uh, clotted cream, um, jam, and you know, sugar be damned. I would feast on that and the sandwiches. Um, and tea. So a very classical English cricketing tea is mm -hmm. my idea of tea, though there are other great places with lots of options, Indian grounds, West Indian grounds, where you get a lot more spicy stuff, South Africa. But because I'm not a meat eater, I can't really revel in, in the, in the non-vegetarian mm -hmm. preparations. But yes, uh, tea at Lord's is, is perfectly fine if I could just have everything that's on the menu. 
Okay. Well, I'll um I'll give you I'll give you a, a classic English tea. Um, but I'm going to make you weigh in on the debate. People in Devon think that when you have a scone, you go cream and then jam, and Cornwall it's the other way around. It's jam and cream. When you have that to eat, do you go cream jam or the other way around? Cream jam simply because uh, that way I can uh, uh, have a lot more jam on the on the scone. <laughs> <laughs> Ever the pragmatist, eh, Prakash? <laughs> always, 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 mate. Straight bat, remember? Uh, exactly. Yes, exactly. Uh, right. We are. I thank you for your time. We're. We're. We are. I've got one question left, and then I'll yes. let you get on with your important business work. Please. Um, casting an eye over your your life in cricket or in business or otherwise. And this will be very hard for you to distill down, I imagine, given all the vast experiences that you've had. But what are some of the most precious memories that you hold that you might reflect on when you're watching this last game of cricket? It's very interesting that you ask this question on the day when Sachin Tendulkar turns 50. And to me, amongst the many, many memorable moments um, in a commentary box on a cricket ground, I think the, the God-given opportunity of being able to commentate on Sachin's last test match, and not so much the match, but the actual uh, period when there was only one, one person and he didn't even have a quick bat in his hand, uh, holding and enthralling the crowd, both who were watching on television and, and at the ground. I think that is the one memory where uh, you know, I still get emotional about it because uh, you you saw this person who arguably is one of the greatest batters ever in, in world cricket become this sort of very humble young little lad as he, you know, went down on his knees and kissed the turf uh, and said goodbye to everything cricket in a manner of speaking and then the the ovation the uh, the adulation and you saw people who were his contemporaries you saw people who were his seniors i dare say that if the scoreboard had a can of water next to it the scoreboard would have had a tear because there wasn't a dry eye in that stadium and I don't know, it may have been very similar for lots of other people, but for me to have been able to tell them about it, describe it, was absolutely unbelievable. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't trade that experience for anything. Wow. Well, thank you for being so personal with that and offering us an insight into sort of a very intimate moment that you, I'm sure you'll cherish for as long as you, as long as you might live. What I will do now, just to make sure that you're happy, with your choices i'll run through them one time and um as i said see if you're happy with them so this last chance of you watching cricket the dream cricket scenario we're taking place at the old eden gardens in calcutta the batter will be sir don bradman and he'll be facing up to sir garfield sobers um mansour ali khan patodi nicknamed tiger will be captain eknad solkar will be doing what eknad solkar does as fielder, Alan Knott will be behind the stumps. Christopher Martin, Christopher Martin Jenkins will be commentating, and you will be tucking in to a classic English tea, scones, cream, then jam, because that's how you get the most jam on top of the scone. How does that sound? If you're going to have Perfect. to go... Perfect. Wouldn't change it. Wonderful. Well, practically, you've had such a varied and eventful life within cricket and business and all these things that um, really do make me wonder just what it must be like to be you to have all those experiences behind you and all the perspective that you've got. I cannot tell you how much I've enjoyed speaking with you. And uh, all I can really do now is wish you all the very best for the future in everything that you're doing.